I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 62 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 062. Now, I know this episode is late, but I'll get to that after we, uh, after we do the audio for the get show or how to get the show. But first, I want to touch on the gun of the show for this episode, which is a Ruger 2245 Mark III target with a 5.5 inch bull barrel. A lot of, a lot of inside baseball terms there. If you don't know anything about firearms, well, I might, I'll see if I can get around to covering a little bit of that. Now, Stern Ruger got it start when they produced the Ruger standard. Later, a target model was introduced, and that was called the Mark I. The Ruger Standard and the Ruger Mark I were followed by the Mark II in 1982, and the Mark II had both target and non-target models in its lineup. In 1992, Ruger announced the 2245, which featured a polymer frame, along with a grip angle and controls that were more like those found on the legendary Colt 1911. In 2004, Ruger brought forth the Mark III with target, non-target, and 2245 variants. This episode's gun of the show is a Ruger Mark III 2245, meaning it's the third generation of the Ruger standard. It has the 2245 frame, which means it's a polymer frame, while well, all the Mark III's are. It has the grip angle of the 1911, and the controls are in uh, almost exactly the same location as they are on a 1911. It does have a 5.5-inch bull barrel. Now, the bull barrel means the barrel's the same diameter where it goes into the receiver and uh, near the muzzle. There is some tapering and crowning allowed on, you know, when it claims a bull barrel, but basically the barrel is the same diameter all the way down. And of course, this particular Mark III 2245 is in stainless steel. Now I have a story behind this gun. This isn't a gun I bought that I went out and bought because, oh, I think that'd be a neat gun to own or, oh, uh, that's interesting or I really wanted it. I was at a gun show, had my nephew with me. Me and him were looking at different firearms that were available. This is my oldest nephew. And, you know, just generally looking to see what was out there. And he was identifying just about everything we saw. He was, uh, it was funny because he was actually identifying variations on AK-47s that I didn't really know existed. He, he is a prodigy in that regard when it comes to firearms and things like that. However... We get to this one table, and it's a dealer I know. He sees this pistol, and I'm carrying a pistol I'm thinking about selling. And when I say I'm carrying it, I'm carrying it in a case. It's, we're at a gun show, so the action's been locked open with a zip tie and, you know, the typical gun show type rigmarole on it. So we're sitting there, or we're standing. I'm standing there talking to the dealer. I've, I know him. Gee, a gun dealer at a West Texas gun show, and I know them. What are the odds of that? pretty high. But anyways, we're standing there talking and my nephew, he says, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir, but my uncle wants to sell this gun. And I was wondering if we could trade it for this Ruger over here. And when you get right down to it, I lost, I lost money on the deal. But when it, when my nephew's smile crossed his face on hearing that, yes, we would make that deal. And basically this was his gun. It was more than worth it to me. That was probably the best deal I ever got on a gun. Even though I lost money when you sit down and figure value, I probably lost a little. But it's still the best deal I ever had on a gun. Now then, the particulars on this gun, it's a model, and this is Ruger's catalog number or model number off their website. Actually, it's not even their website. It's, on, it's what's on the hard case of the gun. It's model number 10110. Caliber is 22 long rifle. Capacity is 10 plus 1. It is a single action pistol, has a fixed front sight with an adjustable rear. Now, because it's a target model, the scope base is included with the gun. It has a polymer frame with a stainless steel barrel and receiver. This particular gun was produced right around the time Ruger announced that they were installing removable grip panels on the 2245s. It weighs in at 35 ounces, and in regards to MSRP, it's out of production, so mm, I'm not even going to bother trying to give you an estimate on the price. Now then, I'm going to run the audio that tells you how to get the show in case you're getting it from some unusual source, and then I'll come back and I'm going to give you a rundown why this episode is rather late. 
The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Typically, I record the show on Friday or Saturday, depending on which day I'm off that week. Unfortunately, this week it fell on Saturday, and we had a pretty heavy storm. But I thought, well, you know, I may lose power, but most of my equipment will work without power so or without electricity at the house because a lot of it runs on battery. And when I say a lot of it, the bare necessities runs on battery. So I sit down at the computer, I hit print, and start to print off the show notes. It gets about, oh, uh, I don't know, down to the gun of the show part of it, and suddenly the power goes out. And the power is out about four hours. When we finally get the power, or while the power is out, I decided, you know, I'm going to I won't grab the equipment. I'm just going to do this off the top of my head. Unfortunately, the room that I'm recording in, we had, the storm had a lot of wind, heavy rain. And when I say a lot of wind, I mean, it was high winds. And there's a lot of noise hitting the side of the house that the studio, that I use as a studio. Or with the room that, the room that I use as a studio, a lot of noise is coming in because wind's hitting that side of the house. So I decide I'm just going to go out to the Jeep. I'm going to sit in the Jeep and record it there. Give it a little bit of a different sound and be unique. So I'm I'm there. I'm recording this episode for 45 minutes. I get it done. Audio comes on. Or not audio. The lights come back on. I go inside. Pop the SD card into the notebook. And I'm I'm kind of liking what it sounds like. Then suddenly I hear semi-truck doing a Doppler effect. And then I, and I realized the mic, when there's road noise going down, the mic focuses on it. And a lot of podcasters that are in the business of teaching you to podcast will tell you, hey, if you can't find a quiet room, go out to your vehicle. And normally that's a good idea, unless your vehicle is a Jeep Wrangler. The reason for that is most vehicles, not Jeep Wranglers, but most vehicles are built with high quality sound deadening. And it tends to be a good quiet place to record a podcast if everything you got runs off batteries. Unfortunately for me, it, it didn't quite work out that way. Well, I'm thinking, okay, I'll just record Sunday, and I'm going to go ahead and go to bed because I'm exhausted. Go to work. I come home, and there's a lot of debris in my yard. And when I say a lot of debris, I mean I got trees that, are, that had lost some pretty significant limbs due to this wind, wind and rainstorm. So I start taking these limbs, picking them up, uh, dragging them over by the dumpster so the city will come pick them up, and it starts raining again. And I know we got some, a chance for severe weather, and the lightning hits. Okay, I go inside, and the wind's coming in again. It's strong. There's a little bit of pea-sized hail in the storm, and it's, you know, the audio would not be all that good because you'd be hearing hail on the side of the house. As a result, I decided I'm not going to record on Sunday either. So here we are, a little bit around 1.30, 2 o'clock on Monday afternoon. I'm recording the episode now. The episode's going to be a day and a half to two days late. I apologize, but what can we do? After all, I do have high-quality standards where I'd like you to hear my voice and not an audio track full of, well, noise from the highway. With that said, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to follow the show on social media, and then I'll come back and I'll hit the main topic. And after the topic, I do want to, or before I go into, before I do the social media clip, I do want to say that I want to try something new. We don't have legislative updates anymore because, well, the legislature's out of session until 2016 or 2017. What did I say 16? Oh, because we, the bills we care about are going into effect in 2016, or some of the bills. Anyways, 2017 will be when we see legislative updates again. Uh, probably late 2016 when bills start getting pre-filed. However, because we don't have a legislative update, I am going to start throwing some scenarios out there for you to think about. And if you cannot answer this scenario, and you cannot come up with flaws in the scenario, or you cannot, or you think about it, and, you, and you're thinking, yeah, that's the only way that could happen in that situation, then maybe... Because these scenarios, I'm going to leave them open for interpretation. You may say, well, uh, I would do it this way in this situation, but if this was a little different here, and you don't mention if that's the case, I'd do it this way. Well, 
I am going to throw these scenarios out there. And if you cannot dissect these and analyze what you might do or what you should do, or maybe you wonder why was it done this way? Maybe, just maybe, you need to track down and get some training. And I don't mean training like uh, tactical training. Maybe it'll be legal training. Maybe we're talking about training on how to operate the weapon in certain situations. Or maybe you're wanting, maybe you need training on the manual of arms for your weapon. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you determine, could I do this? Would I know how to do this? And if you're not sure the answer is no, maybe you seek out that training that you might need. Or maybe you seek out that training that you do need. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. And I'll be doing a little bit of editing right there because, well, there's a noise that I'm still trying to figure out what that was. The topic for this episode is carry rig selection and carry behavior. As far as the gear goes, you got to choose a gun. And we're going to concentrate on handguns because January 1st, we're going to have legal open carry. Maybe we want to carry a semi-auto or maybe we want to carry a revolver. Maybe we want to carry a combination of the two. Well, guess what? You can do that. So let's talk about the advantages of semi-auto and revolver. Some people will tell you, well, a revolver is a better gun to carry because they don't ever fail. Wrong. Did you know there's a failure drill for revolvers? And did you know this failure drill exists because revolvers have failed? That's right. Well, let's talk about uh, why someone might choose a revolver over a, over a semi-auto. Maybe they're more familiar with a revolver. Maybe there's something about the grip angle that fits their hand better. Maybe that's what they trained with when they first learned to shoot. And as a result, that's the gun that they carry when they, normal, when they need a gun. For self-defense, they choose the revolver. Even though the semi-auto may have more capacity, be easier to reload for most people, and when it fails, it's a lot easier to bring back into the fight than a revolver. Keep in mind, when a revolver goes down, they go down hard. You may be able to bring them back into the fight with the proper application of a malfunction drill, and you may not. Semi-auto will more than likely be able to be brought back into the fight, but these are all things that it's going to be influenced by your training. A lot of semi-autos have more capacity than revolvers, while some revolvers are going to match or equal the capacity of some semi-autos. And it's possible that a semi-auto may have less capacity in some cases than some revolvers. And that's a scary thought. But you have to consider certain operational details of a firearm. Do you need a safety? Do you need a decocker? Do you need ambidextrous controls? These are all things that somebody that's going to be carrying a gun needs to keep in mind. Also, is the firearm compatible with family or friends' weapons that you're going to be with on a regular basis? If you and two friends go everywhere together, and you all carry firearms that can share magazines, instead of having one magazine as a reload for yourself and one in your weapon, you now have one in your weapon and as many as five reloads. Because if one of your friends gets shot, well, suddenly his firearm and or magazines are available to you if he's taken out of the fight. Or if you're injured and your significant other needs a weapon and yours just happens to be the same manual of arms or just happens to have a compatible magazine with ammunition, suddenly that significant other has more, has more of a fighting chance than they did if uh, your gun was unfamiliar to them. And these are considerations you need to have in mind. They shouldn't be deal breakers, but they should be something you consider. And you always want to carry magazines. And I'm not talking about the books. I'm talking about the things that carry bullets and uh, cartridges. They carry bullets that are part of cartridges that go into the magazine. And the magazine goes into the weapon so that it can do the auto-loading part of the auto-loading design. Now, magazines are the source of most semi-automatic handgun failures. As a result, you want to carry at least one, preferably two or more spares. This means you have extra ammunition if you need it. If your magazine causes the gun to malfunction, you can just simply change magazines. And it reduces the need for a higher capacity magazine to some extent. Now, right now, the tactical mobs are out there 
pulling their hair out, screaming at me. He didn't say you could need it. You could reduce the need for capacity, did he? Why, why, why? All the Navy SEALs keep getting more and more and more and more and more capacity. And if you're gonna if you're gonna be a true operator, you need a 300 round drum magazine in the bottom of your 1911. No, I'm saying it reduces the need for capacity in the magazine in some cases or to an extent. Meaning, if you're carrying nine magazines that have 10 rounds and your buddies are carrying, I don't know, three magazines with 30 rounds and you each have three magazines fail, you still have six magazines that can function. They don't. Think about that. You can carry fewer, you can carry more magazines with less capacity, making, making uh, the statistical probability of failure a a uh, less critical issue than if uh, you don't carry smaller magazines. Now, of course, you can carry more magazines with a higher capacity too, but it's going to be more weight. And, you know, they say ounces turn into pounds and pounds turn into pain. And there's a reason for that. Now, we're going to move on to holsters. Holsters tend to be made out of a number of different materials. I'm going to say right now, do not, I repeat, do not. And let me say this again, do not. Is that enough do nots? Because please do not carry a holst a gun in a holster made out of nylon, especially if there's no retention mechanisms in the holster other than friction. You will regret it. The two materials I like to consider are kydex and leather. And there's three variate there are three holster styles that come to mind with these two materials. There's holsters made strictly out of kydex or some other polymer material. There are holsters made strictly out of leather, sometimes with other organic materials used in there for lining or decoration purposes. And then you have a hybrid holster that has, say, a leather backing and a kydex shell. These are real popular in the concealed carry world, but you find them in some cases for open carry too. Kydex has an advantage that it doesn't really damage the finish as badly as leather. Leather holsters tend to be lined so that they, or they don't tend to be lined, but they tend to have the option of a, of a lining so that it doesn't damage the finish on the gun as bad. And a lining would be like a sheepskin or maybe even another softer material inside the holster that goes between the gun and the holster so that the leather does not wear on the finish of the gun. An unlined holster will damage the finish of a gun just like a lined holster will damage it less quickly. Kydex, it does damage the, it will cause, or any polymer material will cause holster wear. It just won't be as quick or as pronounced. And another consideration when you're getting a holster is, well, the belt. Let's face it, you want your belt and your gun and your holster to match in coloration. And you really need them to match as far as the width of the belt goes. The belt has slots in it, the most common, or the not belt, the holster has slots cut in them. The most common size is inch and a half, and your belt needs to have an inch and a half wide, uh, needs to be built so it's an inch and a half wide to tightly and snugly fit that holster. And we'll go into more details on the belt in a moment, but really the width and the color is the only consideration you have to have when you're considering the holster and the belt together. Or you're considering the holster for the belt. Keep in mind the width and the color of your belt. Mag carrier. Everything that I said about a holster applies to a mag carrier. Once again, Kydex or polymer materials, less likely to damage the finish on a magazine. Leather, you have lined and unlined as well. Please, for the love of God, do not use a mag carrier that's made out of nylon. That's an even worse idea than a holster. And once more, you do have your belt considerations of width and color when it comes to your mag carriers. And now that we've said that, we need to touch on the fact that, well, the belt. We've mentioned the importance of the belt on the holster and the mag carrier. Well, let's talk about the dimensions first. The width of the belt. The most common belt width in the gun world is an inch and a half wide. An inch and a half wide belt fits just about every holster that's made for the civilian market. Or not every, but the vast majority of them. The length of the belt is important because that means that the belt fits you or not. Well, consider this. You get a belt and you follow the instructions of the manufacturer on measuring yourself to make sure you get the right length of belt. You get it. You order it in the same color as the holster you plan to carry. Everything is good. 
but you didn't quite follow the instructions on the manufacturer's website for the belt, and suddenly you find that your belt that you should be buckling up at the middle notch is now being buckled up at the very endmost notch, whether it's the belt's too big or too small, you suddenly don't have room to carry your gun if you're going to carry it concealed. So you got to order another belt. The reason I bring this up, a real good friend of mine in Lubbock ordered three different belts because he just was too impatient to read their instructions on the website and order a belt that was the right size for him. Good belts, bad choices. Let's just put it that way. But what makes a good gun belt? Well, a gun belt's almost always going to be two layers of leather. The grains are going to be crossed so that while one, the grain will run lengthwise, the other, the grain will run the width of the belt. Now, some actually come with a third layer, and those tend to be a little bit difficult to wear because they're super thick, even if they're using very thin leather. And these will have the grains turned so that the third layer is either random or it's going, it's going uh, in a 45-degree angle to the other two grains. When somebody considers that, I suggest they consider Kydex reinforcement strips in their gun belt. It's smaller. The Kydex is smaller and thinner. It's stiffer. And it's cheaper. Plus, it's a lot easier to deal with. And there's other additional features that you can find in a gun belt, such as a different buckle. Or maybe they're dressed up and they have conchos on them. But that's all personal choice. Me, I like to keep things plain and simple. But we need to talk about behavior when you're openly carrying or even when you're concealed carrying. And there's some things you need to keep in mind in regards to your behavior when when you're openly carrying or just when you're carrying. Anytime that you're carrying a gun and there's an incident that you're involved in, keep in mind, because you're involved and you're carrying a gun, there is a gun involved. This means you have to address it like the person that is approaching you in a road rage situation may, may produce a weapon. However, you have to approach it like they may produce your weapon because you may lose control of it. You have to keep this in mind. Anytime you're involved in an incident, there is a gun involved. And, please, for the love of God, think of yourself as an ambassador for gun rights. Try not to do anything that supports the anti-gunner stereotypes. Try to do nice things for people. After all, when you're done and you're carrying a gun and these people know that you're carrying a gun because it's openly or... Maybe the wind blew your cover garment up if you're carrying concealed. You want these people to think, I wish they were my neighbor. Not, I don't want them to be my neighbor because they got guns. I'll, you want them to think, I wish they were my neighbor because they, are such, because they were so nice. And stay calm. Use language that is acceptable for use around children. And when you're carrying a firearm, keep in mind that things you don't want to happen can, and in some cases eventually will happen. Also, there's appearance and physical considerations to keep in mind. Dress nicely, or if you can, and it's even better if you do, dress professionally. Do not make non-firearm political statements while you're carrying because you tie Second Amendment issues to your position on these unrelated issues, and people will naturally apply their position on that other issue to gun rights. You can and most likely will if you're carrying a firearm and you bring in a non-firearm-related political issue you can and most likely will be accused of trying to intimidate those that you disagree with. It's not because you're trying to intimidate them. It's because you got a firearm. They're going to think you are trying to intimidate them, and they will accuse you of it. Also, don't touch your weapon unless you need it. And I do mean don't touch it. Seriously, don't touch your weapon if you don't need it. You see officers breaking this rule a lot. They'll put their hand on their gun and use it as a rest. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Did you know almost every negligent discharge has been proven to have happened because people were touching the firearm? That's right. They were touching the firearm when they didn't intend to discharge it, and somehow it discharged. If you don't handle that weapon, you don't touch it unnecessarily, you eliminate the vast majority of the risk of a negligent discharge. And it's not necessarily a negligent discharge on your part. It may be the negligent discharge on the part of an officer who sees your hand on a gun out of the corner of his eye, and reacts like he thinks you're drawing on him. The life you save by not touching your firearm could be your own. If you don't need to touch it, don't touch it. Now, when you're dealing with a confrontational party in public, there's some things you need to keep in mind. You have to be the bigger person here. You're the one with the gun. You're the one that's known to be armed. 
and you need to you have to let them be the crazy ones if it's just a debate use emotion no i'm kidding if it's a debate use fact not emotion emotional arguments always get out of control quickly because of the word emotion and remember you can always walk away from an anti-gunner and if they follow please please politely ask them not to if they continue to follow you maybe they're yelling or screaming or ranting or threatening you call the police let them deal with the crazy person if they refuse to disengage and by walking away you make them look crazy and possibly dangerous themselves imagine there's this crowd of people watching this man come up to a guy that's openly carrying a firearm and the man that's coming up and approaching the, the armed individual screaming and yelling uh maybe he's screaming baby killer and maybe he's screaming uh reproductive organ jokes or whatever it is he's yelling and screaming you as the license holder or the person that's legally armed you tell them uh you try to disengage you start to walk away they start following you yelling and screaming maybe even making threats you call the police the police show up and this crowd that's been hearing this guy rant about how people that are carrying guns are dangerous how people that carry guns are killers they get to see the guy that's acting crazy, get arrested, while the guy that's acting calm, polite, and reserved, he is there talking to the police calmly, shaking hands, and he's acting like a sane, reasonable person, just like they are. Maybe he held the door open for the grandmother of the family of five over there. Maybe when maybe when the lady that is when the lady that's got a that's walking with a cane needed to go down the stairs maybe he held his arm out so she could brace herself on his arm since there's no railing on those stairs and they're all thinking he's a nice guy he's armed and he's doing nice things this guy that's anti-gun is crazy as uh well we can't say it here but the guy that's unarmed is crazy the pro-gun guy is normal sane and i want him as my neighbor guess what you're winning their hearts you now control the emotional argument and you have the facts to back you up if they just want to debate use facts maybe it'll make them go crazy keep in mind though you got to stay calm you got to stay measured and you have to do the right thing and sometimes the right thing may seem like you need to explode and yell and scream right back at them but that's not the right thing to do but let's talk about dealing with public officials and by public officials we mean people who can arrest you when you have an encounter with a law enforcement officer or a or some other person that has the authority to interact with you because you're carrying a firearm, record audio and video if you can. If you can only get audio, get audio. If you can only get video, get video. But the thing is, you want to record. And when you're dealing with this public official, record with the hand that will be that would be used to draw the weapon because you have the camera or the cell phone in the hand of the that would be used to draw the weapon you can now you can now should the officer say hey he tried to draw his weapon on me and that's why i arrested him well you got the video and the audio and they see your left hand in the video and you tell them i was holding the camera with my right hand you can see my left hand there and the gun was on my right side how did i try to draw the weapon video and audio keep people honest now, when you record this audio and video, don't put it up on the internet and brag about how you put this person in their place. If they did something wrong, contact your Second Amendment organization and share the video and audio with them. They can use it better when it go when it comes time to present information to the legislature saying, hey, we're having a problem with this, and here's proof of it. If this is something that they have never seen before, the gun banners have never seen it before, they cannot come up with a, an excuse that's been pro- Uh, that's been prepared six months a year in advance instead they have to roll with the punches as i said before when you're recording record with your hand that will that would have access to the weapon because you want to keep your hands clear of the weapon and this is for your safety this is to keep you from getting arrested for supposedly trying to draw a weapon it's to keep you from accidentally resting your hand on your weapon making them think you're trying to draw and try to avoid arguing with them on the side of the road in the end there's a saying it's popular with law enforcement it's popular with those that are activists you may beat the rap but you won't beat the ride keep that in mind and remember 
When it comes to arguing with law enforcement, that's what courts are for. And this is going to be the last part I want to talk about when you deal with public officials. Do not resist being disarmed. Do not resist any searches. Do not de- resist demands for ID. And definitely do not resist any kind of arrest, no matter how wrong they are when they're doing these to you. All right? I cannot stress this enough. Do not get aggressive with law enforcement. Resisting a search or an arrest is a crime, even if the arrest or the search is illegal itself. You want to be on the best footing possible for any kind of legal action. And when you appear compliant and non-confrontational, This will help you when you are involved in these legal actions. If you calmly and politely explain that you do not willingly consent to the search or the arrest or to the disarmament or to providing your ID, but that you will because you're you're not going to resist their demands and you want to avoid escalating the situation because, well, you don't want to get arrested. Guess what? When you do that and it's recorded on audio or video, you suddenly gain an upper hand when it comes back to that legal action. And remember, your rights mean nothing to you if you are dead. If you get confrontational, you get aggressive, and you are openly carrying a weapon, there is a good chance you will get shot and possibly killed. And you want to avoid that. In the end, you want to go home. You want to go home alive. With that said, I want to wrap the contact portion up and... I'm going to run the audio clip for the contact portion, and we'll hit the news. I actually have, think I've got four stories on this one. And after that, well, we'll hit the sign-off, and then we'll do our scenario for this episode. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, our first news story is one where the father of the Dallas PD shooting suspect says his son snapped due to stress. It's interesting to note that the article mentions the suspect had multiple family or domestic violence cases pending, making it illegal for him to own or purchase or even possess a firearm. Now, Dallas County has been actively confiscating firearms from people charged with domestic violence. Sounds like that little plan's working very well, doesn't it? And I think that could be our scenario basis for our next for next week's episode is the Dallas PD shooting. We'll decide later, or we'll decide next week. Texas Rangers are investigating an officer-involved shooting in Donna, Texas, where police were called to a domestic disturbance. Upon arrival, police gave chase to a suspect who fled the scene until his vehicle spun out of control. When police officers ordered the suspect to stop, he tried to run over an officer, which caused officers to shoot him. Now, the suspect is alive, or at least at the time the article was published, and he was in the hospital recovering. Now, in politics, we've got two stories. The first is where the Lubbock Avalanche Journal has an article by their editorial board where they bemoan the passage of gun laws and say they are hopeful because 20 years ago, nothing bad happened when concealed carry passed. Funny. They mention that, and they're, and they still do not think it's a good idea to pass campus carry and open carry. Well, some of them. They talk about how, well, let me put it this way: this, the article is schizophrenic, and they do admit that their editorial board is divided on these bills. This is what happens when you get a news article written by a committee. Now we're going to talk on one last one. It may be better to put it in the in defense of self and others, or it may be better to put it in miscellaneous, but I put it in political because that's where it's seeing all the, it's being used as political fodder. Now, the officer who was recorded on video wrestling a 15-year-old female to the ground and later drawing his weapon on two other teens has resigned from McKinney PD. His attorney points out that he responded to two suicide attempts, with one being successful the same day. Well, the same day as this incident. Having watch the unedited video, I can say that I do have some hope for the youth of today because, well, the one youth that was recording the video and his friend pick up an officer's drop flashlight and returns it to another officer while telling the officer who lost the flashlight. That's pretty cool. These kids actually, these kids are giving me hope. I mean, yeah, they were there because they received this invitation off social media and they got involved in this big brouhaha, but there's still hope. And did you notice 
Not once did I mention the race of anybody in there. That's because the Gun Rights in Texas podcast is colorblind. We see everything in shades of gray. Or at least that's our official policy. Anyhow, I have talked to somebody online, not in person, not with voice, but via um, messaging, that lives in this community. And they're telling me all kinds of things. But we're going to touch on that, and that's going to be the basis of our scenario when we come back from the sign-off music. With that said, I'd like to say please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Now, to replace the legislative update, we're doing a scenario of the show. And this this episode, our very first scenario of the show, we'll come up with a we'll come up with a better name for it than that, is based on the McKinney, Texas pool party incident. And here's the basis of it. You are alone and you're under attack. You have a Texas concealed handgun license and you're armed. You are a resident at Craig Ranch in McKinney, Texas. You just witnessed one, possibly two security guards get attacked. You have called 911 and the police are on their way. And then you realize somebody you care about is out there somewhere in that mess. Now, this someone may be your child, your significant other. Or maybe they're like a brother or a sister or an elderly mother. But whatever it is, this is somebody you feel a need to defend. And when you find them, they're being attacked. You pull the attacker off your significant other or your child or your family member. And then you tell them, to go home while you keep their attacker restrained. And while you're attempting to restrain their attacker, you have two unknown teens rush you from the side. You turn to confront the teens, and one reaches toward or even into their waistband. And that's where we're going to leave you with the scenario. Keep in mind, you have a CHL and you are armed. You're trying to restrain one attacker who was attacking a family member, a significant other, or even a child. You have two teens attacking you from or rushing you from the side, you turn to confront them, and one, maybe both of them, reaches, is reaching toward or even into their waistband. Think about how you respond to that, because that's based all off the video, the unedited video for the, uh, from the above. And I want to leave you with this. People who have spoken out in support of the officer in Craig Ranch, in the Craig Ranch community, have had personal information released on the Internet. They have been attacked in social media. One woman that Liz and Craig Ranch has been bullied in or has had her employer bullied into terminating her. And that's a scary thought. That's a real scary thought. And think about the think about the scenario for this show. How would you address it? How would you react? If you want to email me with your response to it, that's great. You don't want to, but you're going to think about it, that's even better. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly.